The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Today's message, I'm titling it, God Confidence. And let me tell you why I'm even titling that. As we've been ministering this week uh, to different people, different parts of the country, and I'm not talking just in the congregation here, uh, as I've been ministering to them and they've been finding personal freedom, subjectively, they say, there, I know. I say, how, do you, how does it feel? And I usually accept them to say, peace, peaceful. I, I feel the peace of God I've made. And instead, they've been saying, stronger. And if I went just by my discernment, what it felt like is the spiritual man's supposed to discern all things. And two areas to discern is one is the areas of need or the motivation. Discernment identifies the source of a particular person or situation, a condition, to discern a condition. But it also, you can discern prowess or muscle or strength. And lately, almost everyone, uh, it's been coming up, people that don't even know each other. I'm on the phone with people from different parts of the country. They're saying that as they're getting ministry, they feel strength on the inside. And Strength, by my discernment, I would have called it spiritual prowess or muscle or God confidence. God confidence is uh, the title of the message this morning, but in, in reality, it covers meekness and humility. And understanding these is, is very helpful. God confidence is a spiritual strength on the inside Your confidence is in God, not in self. That would be the opposite. God confidence is complete reliance or trust in God, and it's the opposite of self-confidence. In other words, scripturally, apart from him, I can do nothing, balanced with, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can you see the need? The need there is God. He must be in the equation. So God confidence is basically I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but apart from him, I can do nothing. Uh, It's complete reliance and trust in God. It's the opposite of self-confidence. And I found it very interesting that, you know, when you read in your Bible and it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That word fool has nothing to do with intelligence. That word fool has to do with a self-confident rebel. It's the self-confident rebel that has said in his heart, there is no God has nothing to do with intellect. Most of the time, when you see the word fool in the Bible, most of the time, it's a self-confident rebel. Someone who thinks they can do it without God. And they only inquire of God when they're in a crisis. And then they, you know, talk about foxhole uh, Christians. Uh, You know, they want nothing to do with God until they're in a dangerous position. Then they cry out louder than most Christians. Oh, God, help me. Okay. But God confidence is that complete reliance. And I saw in this contrast of God confidence and self-confidence that everything that we're teaching, and this was taught during this month, I believe, in the training, is a continual repetition that what we are transitioning into is God focus in us, not in heaven. We used to go, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we'd go to some of the best churches in New England. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Where's Jesus? 98% of the audience would point to heaven. So what we're changing is saying that we're to make ready a people prepared for a coming awakening. They're going to have to be aware that heaven came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ. You were born again of incorruptible seed through the word of God, and he is already in you. The key is going to be that many people have Jesus in them, but he's living a confined, restricted life. In other words, he is definitely in you, but he cannot be released properly because that soulish nature is still in control. Mind, will, and emotions is like an outer shell that God is trying to break through. 
The veil in the temple was rent. He doesn't want to be confined in you. He wants to radiate his presence so that you are a sweet fragrance of God in the world. Now, we have three elements that are repeated over and over again. And, and I'm sure Jonathan is studying this for 30 days straight. He's been here every day. He's going to know that you can take everything we're teaching and lay this kind of a uh, uh, profile right over top of it. God focused, God searched, God protected. Say that with me. God focused, God searched, God protected. In contrast to self-focused, those are people that are navel stares who are trying to figure themselves out so that they can cope with life. Do you know you don't have to be a believer to learn to cope with life? I'm not talking about coping with life. I'm talking, talking about the God focus to where self gets swallowed up in life. That which passes through death yet lives. How's that sound? That which passes through death yet lives. Your mind, will, and emotions was not meant to be obliterated. It was meant to be subordinate to the Lordship of Jesus. And in that place of subordination, the Holy Spirit is like a wind through the sail of your mind, will, and emotions. And God becomes an expression out of your life. And it's a place to where you yield to his presence, but it's God who wills and works. It's a beautiful practicing of his presence 24-7. Self-focus, however, copes with life. Isn't that all you can do in and of yourself, apart from him? The best you can do is cope. Self-searched. You know what you're doing when you search yourself and you're just trying to figure yourself out and God's not in the equation? You're trying to control life. You're trying to make it your way, which kind of makes you general manager of the universe, and God is going to be offended with that because he's general manager of the universe. The last thing is self-protected. Self-protected means I'm trying in myself to escape life. All the uh, negative circumstances and people in my life, I'm trying to run away from it. But God basically says, there is something that you have yet to try, old church, and this is the majority of the church. You have yet to practice what the scripture says was let the peace of God guard your heart and your mind. It's not that it's not been known that it's in the scripture, it's not been tried. So in other words, in a hostile environment, instead of you putting up the wall, by the way, in some of the largest churches that we went to in New England, they all nodded their head when we talked about their flesh. So people do know their flesh better than the spirit. And I would say, how many of you know when you're in a hostile environment or you're around people that you don't want to be around, the first thing you do down here is go, you put up a wall, you tighten up, you shut down. How many know you do that? Come on. You go, hi, Ralph. It's like, this is the last person I wanted to see today was Ralph, of all the people on the face of the earth. So down here, you shut down. Hi, Ralph. It's like, I'm listening to you with my head, but my heart is shut. What that means is you're not really protecting yourself. You just excluded from bringing God into the equation. That's self-protection, and it doesn't work. And if Ralph says something evil, it's going to go right through that wall, and you're going to be bummed out and slimed and lose sleep over it. Hmm? So a little reality therapy here. Would you like another plan? God's got a plan in the kingdom that's not been tried. It's called the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. But the, tr the truth of the matter is you can believe it in your head, but until you've tried it in your heart, you don't really know experientially. So God's going to say the next time you're in a hostile environment, drop down to Jesus, and as soon as you feel his peace in a hostile environment, let him say whatever. And I promise you that peace, you will feel what's coming from them but there's a difference between hurt and harming you. You will feel the fiery darts, but they get quenched. And if they get quenched, they can't harm you, but you can feel the hurt. That's enough for you to take home and do homework on because this is subjective. This needs practice. This does not come automatic. You can't write this down in a notebook and learn it. You're going to have to actually try it. All right? Now, the, if you Google... In Christian circles, the least preached sermon, guess what the topic comes up? Humility. 
When's the last time you heard a sermon on humility? Hmm? It's been a while, huh? So before I even said that, I went and checked to see if I preached anything on humility. <laughs> and it was July of 14. I went, Phew. And the funny thing about pride is pride doesn't see itself. Pride, you can see pride in other people, but you don't see it in yourself. Pride is blind, and pride hides. And here's a good one for church people. Guess what? Pride always tries harder. Oh, all right. But anyway, God is basically looking to make ready a people prepared who are God confident. And that does uh, include meekness plus humility. So humility is a heart attitude, but it's expressed in meek behavior. Humility is a heart attitude. And because it's a heart attitude, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, you could actually say humble things with your mouth and be proud in your heart. Hmm? What's the number one rule with discernment? The source, the source, the source. The root has to be either pride or humility. And that number one thing, when Adam sinned, the very thing that he, that he lost was the humility of being subordinate to a walk in the Spirit with Jesus as Lord in the garden. Pride then had to take over. And when pride takes over, it starts ruling. Pride is rooted in Satan. This is making root to fruit simple. People like think, I, I remember praying with people that had uh, various issues in their life and above average intelligence, they always had the same thing. Uh, but you don't understand, I'm a complicated person. Ever heard anyone tell you that? That's an excuse for their problems. Uh, God didn't make anybody dysfunctional. You, you got that way all by yourself. So you're not complicated. Roots are simple. Everything rooted in Satan is basically rooted in pride. Everything rooted in God is rooted in humility. And it's interesting that we don't preach much on humility because humility is the heart attitude that's expressed in meek behavior. Listen to Jesus himself. Jesus himself lived humility before us to give us a, 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 a picture language of what it would look like. Was he equal with God? Was he God? And yet he came to earth and listen to what he says even in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, meek, and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Come to me. If he's meek and humble, and he's the all-powerful God of all creation who was there in the beginning, was and ever will be, from everlasting. He was there in the beginning. He was God. And yet to demonstrate to us the way we should live, he humbled himself. He was the epitome of humility to show us that this is the plan that God had for all of us to understand this. It really makes me wonder then why is humility the least talked about subject in the church? Could there be that this is something we need to learn and apply to our life in some greater measure in order to even make ready a people prepared for whatever God's got in store for us in the days ahead. Humble yourself, the scripture says, basically. So meekness does not consist only in outward behavior, but it does have to do with your dealings with people. It's an ingra inwrought grace of the soul exercised chiefly toward God but when we are meek, listen to this, when we are meek, and the Bible interchanges these words a great deal, but when we accept God's dealings with us as good and therefore do not dispute or resist his dealings with us, it's closely linked to another word that is translated humility. To accept and not dispute. In other words, not argue with God with the dealings that transplays in our life. I used to know Christians when I was a young believer that used to argue, is that coming from God or is that the devil? And in reality, I always felt like, what a waste of time asking that question when in reality it should have been, what is your response? 
That's what God's looking at. It's not so much, is the source God or the devil? Why is that happening to me? How are you responding to it? Are you responding like God or the devil? That's the more important uh, question. And it's really only the humble heart that is also meek and does not fight against God. I don't know about you, but I want a humble heart. And and I can remember as a baby Christian getting all paranoid because when I read about humility and pride, I didn't, I don't know how to do that, God. <laughs> so I'm going, wow, I must be really proud because I don't even know how to do humility. And maybe that's why it's not preached very often. But God wouldn't tell us to do something that we're not capable of doing. And I saw that when it translated in my life, that I saw a God confidence was so superior to the spirit of the age in the world and what we're even teaching our children in school, self-esteem. You need self-esteem. You don't need self-esteem as a believer. You need God confidence. You need the strength that comes from him and dependence on him. All right? So I looked and I said, you know, the one who is meek knows that even insults and injuries are coming from men, are permitted and employed by God. If it's chastening and purifying the elect, so be it, really. In this world, offenses are going to come. So get used to it. That's part of life. Don't be so shocked. But rather look at your response, at your response when, the, when those things happen. Meekness is associated with the fruit of the spirit of self-control. I like that. Meekness before God Self-control is not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. You have the power to act and you choose not to. Kind of like, kind of like uh, I had a chihuahua. Uh, you know, Jason probably remembers the chihuahua, but this thing, this thing was always showed its teeth like it was going to bite your leg off. And but then I had, I had a, a big Dalmatian that just basically looked at you. Like, if I want to, I can bite your leg off. I don't have to go, the other one's trying to prove something it's not, right? So uh, I'm basically saying that meekness is the fruit of the spirit of self-control, power under control. You don't have to exercise it. You can exercise restraint, even if you have the power to do something about it, all right? And that's, that's a God confidence. That, that's basically saying I am so secure in him that I don't need the external. And humility <clears throat> means being God-reliant rather than self-reliant, which ironically always exalts self, doesn't it? Self-reliance always exalts self. And the person then thinks they're going to establish their value or their worth. But therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he will exalt you. I found this interesting that humble yourself that God may exalt you, that Jesus humbled himself and that he was exalted with a name above every other name, that the way to promotion is through humility. And isn't it interesting that the, there's such a contrast in... Uh, in the enemy, and I want to get to that a little later, but right now, humility actually means to bow down. And God's principles are completely interwoven with the idea of humility. In the original Hebrew, uh, the signs of it are everywhere. It means to kneel, uh, to bow down. Um, but God, in his wisdom from the fall of man, knew that pride would be our biggest obstacle. Let's say that together. Pride would be my biggest obstacle. And if you couldn't say that, that's probably pride. All right? But God is basically saying humility is rooted in God. The entire dependence on God. That's self being totally dependent on God. If humility is rooted in God, it says, you, O Lord, are able to receive glory, honor, and power for you created all things and by your will they, were, they exist and they were created. Through humility we honor God by presenting ourselves to him more fully. Pride, however, is rooted in Satan. Pride or the loss of humility is the root of every sin and evil. All right, Satan's pride came from desire to be like God. 
It was the poison of self-exaltation. Now, I want uh, those of you that are, want to open your Bibles and follow this, I want you to see this. This is great. In Isaiah chapter 14, we see the fall of Lucifer. And in the fall of Lucifer, he exalts what? What do you exalt if you exalt yourself? Your will? God wants your will. Satan wants your will, right? So apparently whatever is motivating your will is who's controlling you. Satan wants your will. He wants to connect with you. He wants you to own it so he can express himself. But guess what? God wants to connect with you. He wants you to own his character and his nature so he can express himself through you. So basically the battle's for that will, isn't it? Ultimately, they want to get your will. Look at Isaiah chapter 14. And this is entitled, in my Bible, it's the fall of Lucifer. All right. Oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you've been cut down to the ground. You've been weakened. You have weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, not your head. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into the heaven. And that actually, that verse says, with great latitude, I will ascend. Well, you know, great latitude means I'm going to exaggerate. I will ascend into heaven. I will conquer the world, you know. I will exalt. I will exalt my throne. You know what that is? Uncontrolled ambition. Have you ever seen that in the scripture? Selfish ambition? So first of all, his I will in his own willpower says, I'm going to exalt above. All right. He's exaggerating. Exaggeration is also a lie. So he entered into it right away. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. I have uncontrolled ambition. Do you think Lucifer was ambitious? You think it was out of control? Yeah. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. I'm going to dominate. I'm going to have them under my thumb. I'm going to be on top. They will be under. I shall dominate. So it's exaggeration uncontrolled ambition, domination. On the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I want a position. Gee, do people ever do these things? Have uncontrolled ambition, exaggerate? Uncontrolled ambition, want to dominate other people to get to the top? Exaggerate, which is lying. Wanting and longing for position. I need a title, I need a position. I will be like the most high God. Whoa, that's a little arrogant, wouldn't you think? Imitation. You know, God caused you and brought you into this earth as a one of a kind. There never will be another you. There never was another you. Oh, the, the most arrogant thing you could possibly do is try to be like somebody else. When in reality, why would you want to be born an original and die a copy? All right? You are a one of a kind. But in God confidence, you find out who you are. By the way, with all that self-exaltation, isn't it interesting? Do you know God had the last word there? You know what God said? Uh, you shall go to hell. You shall be made a spectacle. You shall be mocked. You're going to be cast out of the grave like a carcass. And you're going to be alone. That's where pride gets you. So, I guess God had the last word, didn't he? But the interesting thing is, everything Lucifer did in self-confident, arrogant pride and self-will, everything he did, everything he wanted that he never got, everything he wanted God would give you if you would be subordinate to him. By humility comes riches glory and life. By humility and the fear of the Lord come riches, glory, and life. You know what that means? Everything that selfish man is out looking for. Riches, glory, and life. Everything that they're seeking in and of themselves by self-will, God said those things are available to the person that will humble themselves and allow me to be Lord of their life. That by humility, and the fear of the Lord. You know, the fear of the Lord is not being afraid of God. The fear of the Lord is having such a love, intimate relationship that you don't ever want to part. There's this thing, oh God, I don't, 
take not your Holy Spirit from me, is, is what David said. That was Old Testament, but the concept is still the same. My heart is knit together with yours, and I do not want separation. I, I don't want separation. What did Lucifer get? And you shall be alone. You should be made a spectacle. You will be mocked. This is what pride will do to any believer. It will mock you. It will come back. So Jesus came and he said, Jesus came to bring humility back to earth so that we could be partakers of it. How come nobody preaches this? The, Jesus came to save, but that is our salvation. The, his humility is our salvation. He saw that, that man's sin and entering into the evil pride and arrogance of, of, of Satan basically cast man out of the garden and had to live in his own strength. And Jesus said to restore the humility, he lowered himself. He made himself of no reputation. Though being equal with God, he had this attitude. And he said, let this attitude that was in Jesus be in you. It has to be humility, has to be the first step. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, glory, and life. All the things that were lost in the fall. All of the blessing, all of the glory, all of the life with a capital L were lost. So Jesus came to bring it back, to save us and restore to lost humility. Jesus lived a life of perfect humility. His humility is our salvation. The gift of salvation calls for our humility. In finding humility, here's the key. Listen to this. Jonathan, this is a word for you. In finding humility, you find that you're a son and a daughter. Without the humility, you just have a slave mentality and you just become a worker trying to earn God's basically saying that when you humble yourself, you enter into sonship and daughters. Pride will keep you from being a son or a daughter. I've seen it even in discipling people. The proud ones never become sons and daughters. The proud ones are looking for uncontrolled ambition, position, all the things in some form or another, domination, Position, imitation. That's a pretty strong word that he gave the, uh, the enemy, don't you think? You will be thrown down. You will be gazed upon. You'll be talked about. You'll be cast out of your grave like a carcass, and you shall be alone. That's where pride will take you. And like we said this morning before worship, no matter how hard you repent, the one thing you cannot repent of is when you refuse to forgive everyone every last little bit. Your Heavenly Father won't forgive you no matter how much you repent. Forgiveness is the gift of a humble God gave to us to cleanse us and redeem us as sons and daughters. It's, we are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should be the most forgiving people. And if you can't forgive them, every last one of them, I don't care who. As a matter of fact, I heard, uh, I think it was in his book, wasn't it? Uh, uh, Jim Baker said that God spoke that to him when he was in jail and said, if you don't forgive every last one, you're not getting out. Now, whether that's true or not, that's a powerful story, and I believe God would do something like that. Because redemption's the name of the game, but he's not going to take shortcuts. It's the blood of Christ that gave us that beautiful gift of forgiveness. And so God's basically saying, let this attitude be in you, which was in Messiah Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Is he setting an example for people? Hmm? So what I like about when Vicky dances, I can be worshiping and have my eyes closed, and I've said this many times, but I've seen people dance and perform that had a need to be seen and heard. And it doesn't release the same anointing. I can close my eyes. Stay humble, Vicky. And I, <laughs> I can close my eyes, and when she's starting to dance, I feel a change in the atmosphere. That's saying something. 
That's saying I'm here to worship God and I'm giving my all to him and it's not about me. It's, humility is the loss of self. And when you lose self and get absorbed in God, there is a confidence that rises up that cannot be defined by a book or by an explanation. It is something that needs to be subjectively experienced. But when you experience, it is the spiritual version of... Um, what we would call uh, Pygmalion, or uh, if those of you familiar with the movie My Fair Lady. Remember the little gutter girl that learned to speak properly? And she could be passed off in high society after she learned to speak without the, the gutter accent. All right? But God is basically saying the spiritual version of that is that God confidence can put you in any arena and you are never intimidated because you're a son and you're a daughter of the Most High God. You know who your father is. And you know who, whose you are. And as he is to you, so are you in the world. But you are in the world only to the degree that as he is to you subjectively. I'm telling you, humility is the principal thing. Humility, listen to this. Have this attitude. Now we're told to have this attitude so it must be possible, correct? Or is the Bible telling us to do something and I don't know how to do that? Have this attitude that was in the Messiah Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. Wouldn't that be a nice thing to just do, say, God, here I am. I'm your son and daughter. I had to do this once when we went through five, five months of not working. <laughs> and basically, Jennifer made the mistake of saying, you know, you're doing pretty good. You know, you're not really having a meltdown or anything, and things are getting rough. And I'm going... As soon as she said that, though, then it started getting rough. <laughs> Got to be careful with these words of encouragement. And right after that, five months, all God, the thing that broke through for me was, even if my life is wasted, it's your life, Jesus, to waste. And it had no more power over me. If nobody can take power over someone who's under authority... If you're under authority, nobody can control that. It's a God confidence that, well, God, I'm you. So I'm, self isn't the issue here. It's not about me. We are a sensitive people to self far too much. But if we were to be given a mandate to get, make ready a people prepared for a coming awakening, I think we're going to have to hear more messages on humility and at least say, Holy Spirit, teach me what that means. And... I can see pride in other people, but I can't see it in myself very well. Show me. Or better yet, why don't I just humble myself? <laughs> and it does say, humble yourself. That's not our job to humble people. He said, humble yourself. So it says, make yourself of no reputation. Take on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, founding found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross, the just for the unjust. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Apparently, that's the way God works, or Jesus wouldn't have lived it that way. Apparently, he was trying to show us something that we need to catch on if we were going to say the highest form of communication is to be an expression. And the highest form of communication for a son and a daughter is to express the Father. What did he say? Jesus said, Peter, you asked to see the Father, but if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Expression beats Trump's words. Because I've seen people going, I am the righteousness of God in Christ with pride. And I've seen people that said, I'm just a worm, just like old Jacob, you worm, old Jacob. Uh, apart from him, I could, oh, it's, it was God, not me, that sang that song. It was God, and false humility. So it's the source, the source, the source. The roots are simple. The branches can be complicated, but the roots are simple. It's the source. True discernment always identifies the source. Everything rooted in God is rooted in humility. Everything rooted in Satan is rooted in pride. Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name. Wow. The sons and daughters of God are becoming a heart attitude. So we know that the meek shall inherit the earth. How many have ever read that? Come on, you've heard these things. 
the meek shall inherit the earth. The promise of the meek, that's not a New Testament revelation. That's, that's in the Old Testament. The meek, and actually the Hebrew word is anavim, shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in an abundance of peace. Wow. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The Hebrew word anav is often translated as humble. It stems from the action of responding or answering and being low. Not only is it considered to mean humble, it's also found translated as poor, meek, and lowly. And Jesus himself described himself that way. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, for I am meek and lowly of heart. If he is, shouldn't we be? The man Moses was very meek, more than any man on the face of the earth. You could say he was the most humble man on the face of the earth. Because God informs Moses that in the future, in the future, I'm going to raise one up like Moses from among the Jewish people. And Moses prophesied to the children. For the Lord your God will raise you up a prophet like me, like me from your midst, from your brethren, and him you shall hear. Did we not have a humble servant that appeared for our redemption and our salvation? So how did Moses learn meekness? How did Joseph learn meekness? Hmm? Before the throne, there was the pit, the prison, before the palace. So don't tell me that all circumstances aren't there for your benefit. Because again, God is looking not for what is the circumstance and who caused that circumstance. He's saying, how did you respond in the circumstance? I once sat at a, at a round table and the round table finally ended a question based on how do you respond? Because it could have gone on forever. Would God put a lot of pain on you as a believer? And they went on and on. Was it God or the devil? And I'm going, you're never going to come to a conclusion like that. How did you respond? That's what we're here on planet Earth for, is our response. For the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's going to be learning a godly response in all things. So Moses learned it. Did he make some mistakes? Did he learn, was he, did he have the school of hard knocks? Did Joseph have the school of hard knocks? But apparently in the re proper response, it made them the kind of son and daughter that we need to be. So it's basically from now on, instead of getting all hung up on, I'm in spiritual warfare, you know how I feel about that anyway. I'm in spiritual warfare. 98% of Christian spiritual warfare is their own carnality attacking them. The devil's not even doing it. He don't have to. You got signs on me. Kick me. I get hurt easily. I've got thin skin. I'm a, I, I, I'm a complainer. I'm a, you know, if you got that on, you don't need the devil. He just sit there and... He did it to me when I was a young Christian and I was in self-pity. And then I had this little cartoon picture go through my head of the devil, pitchfork, you know, red, red suit with the horns. And he handed me a shovel, and it had a gold nameplate on it. It was called self-pity. And the devil handed it to me. And I'm going to tell you, my life is, you don't understand what I've been going through. And I'm, I'm digging a depression that is ultimately going to be the tomb that I'm going to reside in. And the devil was laughing. That got my attention. Wait a minute, he's not even doing it. I'm doing that all by myself. It's like I said. God didn't make any of you dysfunctional. You got like that all by yourself. Isn't that neat? That you are capable of doing such strange things? Hmm? Well, stop it. Get humble. Be a son and a daughter. So basically what God's saying is that the Lord God raised us up one. And he set the stage for how to live. Have this attitude. I know most of your translations have this mind that was also in Christ. But the better translation is attitude. Attitude meaning not mental attitude, but the disposition of the heart. So that if you step on your toe, that's what comes out. That it's not about me. That basically God's going to take me. And the righteous he shall judge. The poor decide rightly for the meek of the earth. The humble ones shall increase their joy in the Lord. When I was praying with people this week and previous week, I was surprised that when many people got a breakthrough and instead of peace, they felt stronger. 
They felt God confidence. And I'm telling you what, you're starting to put on muscle. And by the way, that is my mission. My mission is not to feed the sheep. Mine is to put muscle on you, pull the gold out, challenge you. This is not seeker friendly. Matter of fact, sometimes we're not even friendly. <laughs> All right? But ultimately, we want the gold out of you. Because if you're never challenged, you won't try. Isn't that true? But if you're challenged, you'd be surprised how well you rise to the occasion to be sons and daughters. I was uh, told that even as a young, young, young pastor by, by a man who did research around 70 different pastors in our region, he says, you're an equipper, not an enabler. And I says, well, if I am, if somebody's complimenting me, I'm an equipper as opposed to an enabler, what am I doing different? Because I don't know, I only compare me with me. And I found out that I had an attitude that I believe Jesus put in there. So I can't even take credit for it. You know what the attitude was? I felt like I was such a screw up in life that if I can do this, anybody can do it. And you know, that translates to equipping people because if you made everybody feel like if I can do this, so can you. What's the chances that they're going to rise to the occasion? Much greater than if you say, I'm the expert and just sit there like little birdies and open your mouth and I'll drop a worm in occasionally if you're good. Hmm? Actually, that sounds more like Lucifer. I shall dominate and I will keep you under my thumb. Hmm? That's more of a pride thing, isn't it? But the humble ones shall increase their joy and the poor among shall rejoice in the Holy One. The meek, he will guide in judgment. He will teach his way. This is the passion of my heart, is that the children of Israel saw his actions, but he said, the meek or the humble, I will teach them their ways. Was Moses meek? Was Moses humble? Did he know the ways? It says, Moses knew God's ways. The people saw his acts. I don't want to just see manifestations. I don't want to just see acts. I want to know the flow of what he's doing. I want to know his ways. I want to know that he operates. I want to know the how-tos. I want to know that he operates according patterns and principles. Do you know that in Scripture? That Scripture operates based on patterns and principles? Now, you can't lock it into anything to where you make it happen, but you can begin to see that God operates a certain way according to a certain pattern. Cooperate with those patterns. Learn those patterns. Learn his ways. Not just what he said, but how do I do that? Hopefully, Kingdom Life people, you're a nightmare at conferences. If you're watching by Ustream, you too. I've already heard testimonies of this. Go to a conference, and when they give you a nice, wonderful message, say, how do you do that? Most leaders will stop dead in their tracks and go, the best you're going to get is, just do it. That's not what we need. We need to get so, so yielded to the spirit flow that we learn how to do it. By now, the whole church knows what they're supposed to do. Read your Bible. It'll tell you what to do. But how, do you know, how many of you know that that's not where the problem lies? It's living it out. How do I live that out? How do I progressively walk in the spirit? How do I stay clean? What do I do when I mess up? How do I get clean again? How, how, how? How do I do that? Therein lies the program. But this is the verse that really, that really uh, needs to be taken to heart. By humility and the fear of the Lord. Remember how we explained fear of the Lord? I don't want to be separated. I am attached. I don't want to be unattached. And I don't want anything to come between what he and I have together. I don't want any person, place, or thing to come between what me and Jesus have together. That's the fear of the Lord. We are, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him, and I don't want anything trying to separate that out. And by humility of my utter dependence upon him and my longing to be stayed attached most dearly to him, it says, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches. What kind of riches? Does God want to bless his people? I see people that want to stay in pride and ask for the blessings. Gee, why doesn't it work that way? Who does he bless? He longs to bless, but you've got to be a candidate for that blessing. And it basically says that by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, glory. What was lost in the garden? Glory. 
And what was really lost? The spirit life to you walked in the cool of the day in his presence. You know, most translations say honor. Most of your translations will say, uh, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. But in reality, their, their, their honor, instead of correctly translating the Hebrew word kabod, you know what the kabod is, that's the glory. So by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches of blessings in all realms, all realms. God blesses. You are blessed. When you are blessed, you have a makarios. In the Greek, it's makarios. You are blessed. You have a life joy that is enviable. You know when they used to paint those saints with halos? I think that was just a way of depicting that their countenance, maybe it wasn't as bright as Moses, but it shined and they had a way of displaying it. That was makarios. That even while they were being fed to the lions in the arenas, Christians, the non-believing historians wrote that those believers had a makarios. They have a life joy that is enviable. Certainly didn't envy their, their, nobody wanted to trade places with them, but they saw something even in the arena. They have a life joy that is enviable. That comes from the glory. That comes from humbly saying, self is not the issue here. Self is so swallowed up in God that my confidence is in God, not in me. You know what else an indication of God confidence is? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here's a God-confident example that you can't fake. You can't fake it when you said, my God is able to deliver me from this fiery furnace, but if not, so be it. I'm still not bowing down. That's God-confidence because he put both sides of that. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. Either way, I once prayed with a man that was five weeks old as a Christian, dying of cancer, Every breath was painful, and he was perspiring on his forehead. And all I did was wipe his forehead. And he just said, in, I mean, in that pain, too, in that agony, he says, if I live, I live for Christ. If I die, I be with Christ. Quite frankly, I don't really care. He really didn't know which was better. Someone else said that once, didn't they? This man read the Bible cover to cover in five weeks five weeks. And he was so gloriously changed in his countenance in those five weeks. He went and made amends with people. He got delivered of alcohol, tobacco addictions. And then he basically, after he said that, he got an Episcopal priest so upset at his conversion that the Episcopal priest visited me and wanted to know, what did I do to that man? I haven't asked Jesus to come into his heart. And he was pacing in my living room, beat red face. He was upset. Gee, what do you suppose was upset? Hmm? What was upset? But he was upset. The man said, if I live, I'll live for Jesus. If I get through this, if I die, I'll be with Jesus. And it had a smile on his face. So you'd say, well, it must be the drugs. You know, it must be the this, it must be the that. But it didn't affect that Episcopal priest that way because he made a special trip to my house to ask me what did I do to him. And I had to give him, I had to give him a salvation message. <laughs> I was an irritant. I only lasted in the Episcopal church a very short period of time because there was hundreds of people and, they would, and I would have these, these long talks with him and uh, always made him upset. And then he would, I could say from the pulpit, he would try to. How many of you people know that you're saints? And there's an entire 300 Episcopal congregation. I'm over to go. This is like, oh God, why does it have to be him? Why, uh, nobody else raised their hand, just Dennis knows he's a saint. So you can see my time was very limited. And then I had these children, then they wanted to raise money with a bake sale. I went, oh, bake sale. These kids know nothing. They were going to have a wine and cheese party for the preteens. Oh, God. It's like, 
what do I do with these people? So I'm just a baby Christian, so I'm going, I got a better idea. Let me have them. And so I said, hey, bake sale. I go, oh, geez. I said, I, I didn't like, I wasn't comfortable. I said, I got a better idea. I sabotaged the bake sale. Let's take all the baked goods, all you kids, and we're going to go to the convalescent homes. And we're going to pass it out free. I'll throw the money in for it. And so we went. And the tough guys, the ones that were like belligerent and everything, they were handing cupcakes and watching ladies cry with tears coming down their eyes. And the toughest of the tough softened. And I got to lead them to the Lord. Many years later, he said, um, I wanted you to know I got an A in class on, my, on uh, my book report. I gave a testimony of everything you taught us uh, when we were in uh, youth group and stuff. So it was like, Let's, let's, let's just do something with this. And I have no idea why I'm telling this story. There must be somebody on Ustream that needed to hear all of this, all right? But by and large, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, glory, and life. So we're going to recognize that we need all of those, all right? What does humility look like? Well, if the Holy Spirit accomplishes when we are being Discipline is totally different than what happens when we hear a message. Do you believe that? The Holy Spirit disciplines us. It's totally different than hearing a message. You go, oh, that's a good message. But then if it goes, uh, and you have to actually do something about it, then it becomes subjective. Then it becomes life experience. We can hear a message, but it can be years before that truth actually begins to operate in our life. Do you believe that? I believe that because I pastored long enough. I've had people in my congregation for 15, 20 years and never got it. I had someone come in and in two meetings, boom, they got it. So apparently, it's not about intellect. Apparently, it's a condition of the heart. And it's also the receptivity of the heart. Um, but God ultimately, ultimately wants a yielded will. How many believe that we're all naturally, by nature, I'm talking your flesh nature, obstinate? Anybody in here obstinate ever? <laughs> this stubborn will is supported by our own self-love, our likes and our dislikes. You, you'll hear me often repeat that real discernment must come from love. Love precedes peace. Peace precedes your discernment because if your like or your dislike comes in, it will sabotage discernment. Your preferences are okay. You can have preferences. We all do. But they will distort your perception. So you've got to die to your likes and dislikes because it's the number one killer of discernment. It's just your prejudiced opinion. All right? So basically we're looking for this stubborn will of ours. God's after our will because it's the very core of self. A common feature of those people who have been disciplined by the Holy Spirit, they've been broken by God, they are characterized by meekness. All right? So I'm going to close with this part. Here's the challenge. This is what it should look like if it's coming out of us. We've given a lot of what's it look like, what's the scripture say, how did Jesus do it, but here's how it will look. And this is the desire of my heart. And I'm praying impartation even for discerning of spirits, but much of discerning of spirits comes through brokenness and everyday life. It does not come by an impartation. There's giftings that can come by impartations. There's an element of substance that can come by impartation. But ultimately, it's going to be the work of the cross and by reason of use in your day-to-day -day life that you grow in discernment. All right? But here's what it looks like. And this was, uh, this, I'm taking this word for word out of the only reading material that ever ministered to me. Listen to this. The qualities of meekness, they are approachable, easy to have contact with. Do you know what that means? An approachable person means that, this is Dennis's version, is that when you can feel that you are open to God with this person, regardless of whether that person is open to God. You are secure in your own skin. Again, self-confidence and humility, I really can't see the difference. Self, I mean, God-confidence and humility, I don't see the difference. Because if self-confidence is the foolishness of no God, then for me, the humility that God wants or that dependency is ultimately going to be a God-confidence. Your, your self isn't the issue. 
Self has been yielded over to him. We know in Romans, sin was dealt with. But we also know that self needs to be surrendered. Self needs to be swallowed up in the life of God. And if that happens, you are approachable. You are approachable in the sense of you will know by the spirit, not according to the flesh. The weakness in the church, until they discern from the heart, will always be to judge by outward appearance. Always. And they'll call it discernment. But it's reasoning mind. It's plugging in the loopholes. Uh, Jason's former pastor said that if you don't explain something, the Christians in the audience, if you don't explain it, will eventually plug in their own answer. And that's called suspicion, prejudice, opinion. But it's not necessarily God. Isn't that something? We're that fast. We don't leave it a vacuum. We will put something in there. But unfortunately, the spiritual man discerns all things. It means that he's basically going to be required to discern, not to judge. And discern and know by the Spirit even when you don't have adequate information. Matter of fact, real discernment doesn't need a lot of information. Real discernment knows motive. It knows the source. Their mind, will, and emotions have been dealt with by God. And there's a readiness to respond. Didn't we say how you respond? So approachableness is the one characteristic. How many know people that have an invisible shell? And what's interesting is these people have that invisible shell that's discernible. And in many cases, they have rejection issues. But guess what these people with the shell say? I don't seem to fit. I don't belong. That's because their shell bumps into everybody and nobody really knows them by the Spirit. They only know the wall. Wall to wall is not the way to learn something. That's good for carpeting, but that's not good for relationship. All right? The only legitimate spiritual wall for a believer is peace. Peace will guard your heart, but peace is like a semi-permeable membrane. From the place of peace, you will perceive and discern. You cannot discern without peace ruling. If peace doesn't rule, you can't trust your discernment. You're judging. The second area, and this second criteria, you won't hear talked about in church much, but in my lifetime, I saw two men who knew this inside out and backwards, and these are the ones I identified with. And that is the mark of brokenness and self being out of the way is you will not miss a move in another person's spirit. When's the last time you ever heard that? A sensitivity to where you will never miss a move in another person's spirit. You don't hear that, do you? Hmm? The only two that I heard talk like that and lived in that was Dick Iverson from the coast of California and Watchman Nee. But a broken man doesn't miss a move in another man's spirit. Because what it's saying is you need to discern the condition, whether, it's, whether they're hurting, whether they have spiritual muscle. And if you're not broken, you can't discern. You're going to have to go with this. And that's what most Christians do. They go with this. They fill in the blanks with observations of actions. Obstinance prevents the high sensitivity. But the person that is highly sensitive touches and can be touched. Touches and can be touched. God reached out to heaven and gave you the Holy Spirit. He touched you with the intent that you would know one another according to the Spirit, that you would touch and be touched, that it would be a give and a receive that is spirit, not intellectual, a spiritual giving and receiving. Is that scriptural? giving and receiving the Spirit from the Spirit. It's a Spirit relationship. Highly sensitive. Number one is approachable. Number two is highly sensitive. Highly alert to their environment. As a young Christian, I used to call environment atmosphere. 
When you walk into a room, you feel what? Atmosphere. Some are very confused when they feel an atmosphere because they brought a bad atmosphere with them and then think, oh, this worship service stinks. No, no, you carry the bad attitude in with you. You can't discern until you've got peace here. When you've got peace here, then you can discern the corporate atmosphere. All right? So you're approachable. You're highly sensitive. You're aware of the environment. Now, the downside of this is, in the beginning, the more you get aware of the environment, and you are aware of the environment because you have the same anointing that abides within every believer, the problem is you suck in the negative environments and own it too easily. Three angry people at work and you get angry. That's saying, instead of greater is he that's in me than he is in the world, it's saying three angry people evangelized me today and now I'm bummed. I pulled the cords on all their computers. They made me angry. But they were angry. You weren't angry about anything until they got angry. Then you got angry. They evangelized you. So your spirit is sensitive to pick that up. But the point is you're not supposed to drink it in and own it. Bear witness to it and go, oh, I think I better talk softly in this atmosphere. <laughs> They're about ready to throw things. That would be a redemptive approach to your spiritual sensitivity. The third element is that a person that is sensitive and broken knows not only the Christ within, but from the place of humility, they are ready for corporate life. Isn't that interesting? That God says, I want to build up a habitation of God in the spirit. Everything you read about corporateness in the church, the people that cannot be corporate is because they have walls. And the deception is usually independence. If you were sickly dependent and then you graduated to being independent, you would feel like you arrived, wouldn't you? If you were sickly dependent and then all of a sudden you were independent, you would feel like I've arrived and that's still the problem with believers. That doesn't mean you've arrived. It means now you're your own person. You can advance to further maturity by becoming interdependent. And if you're afraid of that, you're, you're not ready for corporate life. You're not even ready for family. Why do you think so many wounded people don't go to church anymore that love God? And I believe they love God. But the deception is I don't need, I don't need relationship. I don't need family. That's one of the best tools in Satan's tool belt for the average believer. Because God says, I don't have a plan B. The way to restore you to function the way I made you requires interdependence or corporateness. And that's still going to be the, the, the real testing ground for the church. But a God-confident per person, God-confident person is not afraid of corporate life. They're not afraid of interaction. They're not afraid of knowing one another by the Spirit. And lastly... Number three was ready for corporate life. Number four is they're easily edified. Easily edified means they don't have a problem hearing from God. Their receptivity is sensitive enough that it hears the whispers. Most supernatural is too quiet for Christians' flesh, for our flesh. But if you learn to wean that flesh into a place of sensitivity toward God, you find out that there's a whole realm in the still small voice that you've been missing, waiting for the flash boom bang, which only happens intermittently. I like the flash boom bang and the exciting stuff. But you know what? When I look back, there's sometimes years go by without any flash boom bang. You're better off enjoying the moment by moment relationship with the still small voice. Now let me read those four over again. And we're going to close. Number one, the quality for a God-confident person is they're approachable. Highly sensitive is the second element. Third, they're ready for corporate life. And four, they are easily edified, easily built up and strengthened. So Father, right now, to make ready for the days ahead, cause us 
to see Jesus as our number one model of humility as we humble ourselves and let self be swallowed up in his life. That we're teaching even in this place a repetitive, repetitive teachings that continually say, I want to be God-focused, God-searched, and God-protected. Self needs to be swallowed up. No more self-focus, no more self-searching, and no more self-protection. But I'm offering myself to God. I want to pray right now for those of you that feel discouraged and disappointed that things haven't gone your way. God's basically saying, regardless of any change in the circumstance right now, I want you to just humble yourself and say, God, if it, if it doesn't get any better, I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. You'd be surprised how that can snap you out of something. Father, right now, if it never gets any better, if this is the best, this is Jennifer prayed this before we met. If this is all you have for my life, if this is your best, then I want to stay here because I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of your all the days of my life. And if you just pray that prayer and you really mean it from the heart, I believe God will hear that prayer of a broken and a contrite spirit. And so, Father, if this is the best that you have, or if my life is a wasted life, it's your life to waste. And I'll tell you what, the enemy won't be able to touch you. Self will no longer have its strength over you. That I will yield to the lordship of my Jesus. And it says that he gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. I remove all resistance from my heart and my life this day, Lord Jesus that I would never in any way resist you with my own willful strength, my own ideas, my own judgments. And I ask you to cleanse me now. I also release forgiveness to every person that ever pops into my mind. I release forgiveness to absolutely everybody. I release forgiveness, and that includes me. Any harsh judgments I've made against myself, I am welcoming Jesus, the forgiver that lives in me, to cleanse and wash and blot out my transgression. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit 